thank everybody in Bethany for the many cards and visits and for your presence at the viewing at the chapel at uh, Kenbridge and at the funeral and the death of my brother. Thank you very much.
anybody know why we brought the palms and laid the palms up here today? Anybody know why? Christopher says it's Palm Sunday. So what does that mean? What does Palm Sunday mean? Why, why do we do that? Lane says to celebrate. Awesome, Josh. We're celebrating. We're celebrating. What are we celebrating? Josh, you know? Josh, Jesus coming. We celebrate Jesus coming to Jerusalem. So we lay the palms down. You know, a lot of times we watch TV and we have people wear something called a cape. This is sort of a cape, isn't it? Sort of. <laughs> Who wears a cape you can think of? Anybody know? Superman. Superman wears a cape. <laughs> Christopher, who else wears a cape? Batman and Robin. Will, who wears a cape?
seeing as though Tom's wearing a shower, a shower curtain, I feel like I should say something about how communion cleanses us. <laughs>
the bread of life. Let us pray. O oh God of spirit and truth, on a joyous day of Palm Sunday, when your praise is so great that even the stones would cry out, quiet our hearts so that we may perceive Christ come, humble and meek, into our midst. As we drink from this cup of communion, let our attention be centered on the cup of suffering and death that you did not refuse, in order that we might drink from the cup of life and joy that you offer us now. The cup of salvation. <clears throat> For as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again.
19, verses 37 through 44. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an encampment around you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Amen. Today takes a quick turn. We move very rapidly from the joy of Palm Sunday, the joy of the shouting out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in the heaven, and glory in the highest. To Jesus looking over Jerusalem and weeping and lamenting that Jerusalem did not know what would bring peace. That Jerusalem was missing one thing. How quickly things turn from Hosanna, shout Hosanna. No, really, shout Hosanna. <laughs> Hosanna. Thank you. One more time, Hosanna. Hosanna. There we go. How quickly it can turn from Hosanna to mourning and weeping and lamenting. How quickly our lives can turn as well. Many of us have known the emotional roller coaster of being joyful as can be one moment and the next moment, everything crashing down. Or it can happen the other way around where nothing, nothing seems possible to go right. And then all of a sudden, there's a light. There's a hope. And in the midst of that great darkness, just the smallest light can lift us up. We know what the emotional roller coaster of life can be like in Holy Week certainly encompasses all the ups and downs that we might find ourselves on. But today, today we look at the disciples crying out, Hosanna, crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Meanwhile, Jesus is looking at the city, already knowing, already knowing what's coming. Meanwhile, there are the rocks. The rocks. That if the disciples are silent, if others are silent, then the very rocks will cry out. There is so much going on in this short scripture today. We have the disciples. The disciples in the Gospel of Luke are the ones leading the crowds. And it's all Jesus' followers. In the other Gospels, we have people appearing out of nowhere, coming out to shout and sing praise to Jesus. But here in Luke... It says, the whole crowd of disciples. It's very clear. Luke makes it very clear that the crowds aren't just some people who got caught up in the excitement, who saw everybody jumping and cheering and went, hey, I want to go be a part of the jumping and the cheering and the singing and the laying down of the palms. It's not just some people who have no connection to Jesus. These are his disciples, and this doesn't mean it's just the 12 disciples that would look even more odd than just Jesus walking, riding in on the colt to have just 12 people shouting out Hosanna and laying down their cloaks. It would be a pretty short parade. There are more than the 12 disciples. But it may not be the whole city of Jerusalem crying out. In fact, in Jesus' lament, we get a suggestion that Jerusalem may not even be taking notice of this parade, may not even be noticing what's going on while Jesus' followers those who have known him, those who have grown connected to him, they see something's going on. They're excited, they're crying out, they're singing praise, they're laying down cloaks and palms, and they're excited. 
And there are a few Pharisees. Notice throughout the Gospels, there are always some Pharisees around. <laughs> Wherever Jesus is, there seem to be some Pharisees. And we're not really sure. Are the Pharisees always antagonists? Sometimes they do warn Jesus. You know, Herod would like to kill you. Or these people would like to attack you. You should be careful. The Pharisees seem just kind of mildly interested. But now, now they're a little worried. They don't want Jesus' disciples shouting out things like, Blessed is the King, glory in the highest. This is a threat to Rome, and the Pharisees know it. And they prefer to keep a different kind of peace, a peace that has been very uneasy and very tenuous, but at least it's kept people from being massacred. The Pharisees know that's what happens if glory in the highest to the King who comes in the name of the Lord is shouted out. But Jesus tells them, there's no stopping it now. There's no stopping it now. The disciples are crying out, and if they silent or silenced, if you were able to talk them into being quiet, creation knows who I am. The rocks would cry out. They are connected to me in the same way that my followers are connected to me. They know me, and they're going to sing praise. They're going to shout out, Hosanna, to the king who name comes in the name of the Lord. Peace on, in heaven and glory in the highest. They're going to shout out, Jesus says. So we start getting a good picture of what's going on on Palm Sunday and what will continue to take place during Holy Week. Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of God, who at the center is the temple of God, the heart of God, and where God is thought to reside in the Holy of Holies. Is taking no notice. The Pharisees are aware of Jesus and they're there, but they're certainly not singing out. But then there are those who are most closely connected to Jesus. They are crying out. They are ready for the coming King. They are shouting. And if they also remain silent as the city and the Pharisees do, the creation itself will cry out. As is reflected in our opening hymn this morning, Joy to the World, it talks about creation singing praise. This is a common image of how great God is. That even things that we think of as inanimate can praise God, can sing glory to God. And Jesus tells the Pharisees what's going on. But then he notices Jerusalem. And the word that is used in our translation he wept over it. This is a deep pain. This is a word that means lamenting. It means the deepest kind of pain. Jesus is not just sad. He's not just a little melancholy over the city of Jerusalem. He is lamenting. He is weeping. He is boo-hoo crying. He can't believe it. Here is Jerusalem. The city on a hill, the city that is supposed to shine God's light to the world, and it just doesn't get it. The lamenting that Jesus is doing is over the greatest hope, being lost. That which had all of the potential of God's creation concentrated in it, being snuffed out. In the Old Testament, we know God's hope is put in the children of Abraham, the people of Israel. And here is their holy city. And Jesus isn't just sad for the city. He's sad for the future. He is weeping and lamenting for all of humanity because this is where redemption was supposed to come from. And then Jesus says, if only you had known, what would bring you peace? <clears throat> but now it is hidden from your eyes. This reflects, at least for me, back to the psalm from this morning where the psalmist says, the stone which the builders have rejected is the cornerstone, is the capstone, is the most important stone of them all. And here is Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey being praised by only those who know him best. And he says, 
If only you would know the one thing that was missing. You're the builders. You have lost it. You have tossed out this stone. It's rejected. It's seen as worthless and as weak. And so it's not needed. And in fact, you threw it so far away, you can't even find it. It's hidden from your eyes. You've missed it. But what is it? What is that great capstone, that great cornerstone, which the builders rejected? There's a traditional understanding and interpretation of the capstone as it's a person. It's Jesus Christ who is rejected in Jerusalem. And that is a very deep and meaningful interpretation. But what if it's something else? Something, not just Jesus as the person, but that thing which Jesus embodies, that thing which Jesus lives out, and that thing which Jesus preaches on again and again and again and again. When one of the teachers of the law approached Jesus and said, Lord, what's the most important of the laws? Jesus responded, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. At the Last Supper in the Gospel of John, after washing his disciples' feet, Jesus tells his followers, I leave you with this command. Love one another. Jesus tells his followers, No greater love has a man than this, that he be willing to lay down his life for his friends. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Again and again and again. Jesus says, Love, love, love. This is it. Love. Do it. This is the cornerstone. This is the capstone which the builders have rejected. And this is that which Jesus embodies throughout his life and as he goes to the cross. Love. Plain and simple. If we look a little ahead in Luke, we see Jesus going into the temple. And we all know this story. He goes and he tosses tables over and he's cracking the whip and he's driving out the money changers and those who are selling animals. Why? Because they've made God about everything but love. God is about having a perfect sacrifice. God is about having the right kind of money to give. God is about having control and power over people. Remember, a stones that are rejected. But if I asked you, you can tell me why you reject a stone. It's weak. It's seen as that which will not hold up. It's worthless to the building process. And the builders is... Humanity has, throughout the years, looked at love. And they saw it as weak, as powerless. And so they rejected it, as oftentimes we do as well. We say, yes, I want to love, but love can't make things happen. Love can't control, can't force. We have Paul's letter about love, and it says love doesn't do any of those things. Love just is, and does Care, praying for, showing comfort. Those are the things that the builders of Jerusalem saw as too weak. So they rejected it. They said that is not how God works. How God works is through control, through power, through pushing and making and force. And they did the same. They tried to force their followers. They tried to force the people of Jerusalem and the people of Israel into doing just that. And still today in our churches around the nation, we try to control. We try to tell people you have to be like this or do like that or go here or be here. We choose power over love. We don't welcome people just as they are. We don't say, we love you. We accept you. And we want what's best for you. We offer our advice 
We offer compassion. We offer a shoulder to cry on. We offer help when it's needed as it's asked for. Love doesn't do the controlling thing. But too often, I fear Jesus, were he riding into our church, would weep over us as well. Yes, we have love here. Please don't hear this as saying there is no love in Bethany. There is. But we can always love more. And as we cry out, as we shout, as we sing Hosanna, let's remember who we sing Hosanna to. Who we sing to for joy. The one who loved so much that he served. That he humbled himself and rode in on a donkey. That he gave his life, not to control others, but to bring them in and to show them God's great love for all people. Amen. If there's anyone here today who has not experienced God's love, who has not experienced the depths of Jesus' love for all humanity, that he would go to the cross and die for us all, we invite you to come forward and make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, the one who loves us. If there's anyone here today who would like to join together with this body, as we learn to love more, to love more deeply and more truly, we invite you to come forward and do so. And if there is anyone who would like to rededicate themselves, who would like to say, I need more love, we invite you to come forward as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation. Number 550, we'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 4. There's within my heart a melody.